Good morning. My name is Mark Swihart. I'll be the lay leader this morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the North Hills. Whether you've been with this church for a decade or more, or whether this is your first time visiting here, we welcome you. Whatever the faith and traditions of your past are, we welcome you. Whatever your theological stance is, welcome here. Whoever you are, whomever you love, welcome to our church. Wherever you come from, whatever your journey has been, you are welcome here. We'd like to now take a moment early in the service to acknowledge that the land we stand on was taken from the local indigenous people. Inspired by their culture, may we strive to become better stewards of the earth. And newcomers and guests are always welcome to participate in any of our church activities. Currently, as you can see, our services are being led by members of this congregation or by outside guest speakers. This means you can expect every week's gonna be a little different. So if you're visiting for the first time, we invite you to visit several times to get a flavor for it and experience the variety of different services we have. Also, this morning, if you're a visitor here for the first time, if you're so inclined, we'd love to have you introduce yourself. There's a microphone back here. And uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself to us, we'd be happy to hear who you are. Please, yes. Hi, my name is Lisa Robel. I recently moved back to Pittsburgh, and I live in the North Hills now, but I grew up in the East Suburban Unitarian Church, so um, I was lucky enough to, that's my only religion, so. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, everybody. I'm Jill, I'm Josh's friend. We met on Access, and um, I do believe in God, but I'm mad at God. I'm very disillusioned, and but that's another story. But um, I was raised Methodist, but I'm a, now a Reformed Jew, and but I believe in God is love, and God loves us. Welcome, Jill. Thank you. Nice meeting everybody, especially Hal over there. <laughs> Shalom, Hal. Thanks for bringing Jill, Josh. Good. Welcome, everybody. A couple of announcements. Oh, no, first, <laughs> if you'd like more information about our church or about Unitarian Universalism, please talk to our Director of Lifespan Faith Development, Dana Poss, uh, or one of our board members. You can find the contact information for Dana and the board at our website. Now, a couple of announcements. Children this morning are invited to go to their classes at the start of this morning service. So if there are any children left in here, you want to uh, head on upstairs to your classes at this point. Also. So you know, the RE classes and youth group will be conducting a fire drill during the normal class time today. Don't worry, the building alarm will not sound, so it won't interrupt the service, uh, but the RE classes will evacuate to their rally point and then return to their classroom. Once again, welcome to the Universalist, Unitarian Universalist Church of the North Hills. It's so good to be together here and virtually.
beautiful. This morning's opening words are from our speaker, Debbie Stuber. During the Holocaust, over 11 million lives were cut short by evil. But we don't always consider what 11 million lives extended to. Envision the children who were never born, the art that was never created, the diseases that were never cured, the medical breakthroughs that were never discovered, the novels that were never written. The possibilities for these precious souls, all that they did not get to contribute, it is infinite. Let's start our service by lighting our chalice together. The reading for the chalice comes from the Oberlin UU Fellowship. We light this chalice to find inner peace, love for each other, and faith in ourselves. Also to be welcoming to whomever we meet and kind to all living creatures. So gather around this light of hope as we share this time together. Our opening hymn is number 219 in the gray hymnal, Oh, Hear My People. The words will also be on the screen. I'll play it for once. I'm sure you do not know this. It's a traditional Jewish melody. Good morning. I'm Lynn Richards from the Lay Pastoral Care Team. During our service, we create this sacred space for sharing within our community. It is a time to share significant life passages with the congregation so that you can be held in loving care. I'll be reading the joys and sorrows this morning, and Chris Hill will be placing a stone representing each joy or sorrow in the sand. The sand represents our congregation supporting our sorrows and lifting up our joys. Today, we have two sorrows in our church community. First, Jill Weimer's sorrow is that her friend's mom passed away recently from Alzheimer's disease. To Jill and her friend, we say, we're holding you in our hearts. And our second sorrow, 10 days ago, Kurt and Ellen Kuntz lost their 38-year-old nephew, Jeff Gardner, to cancer. Jeff was a superstar of a young man and leaves behind his wife, Jess, and their six-year-old daughter, Emma. Jeff was so loved, and he was an absolutely amazing guy. Everyone who knew him is devastated. To Kurt and Ellen and their families, we say, we're holding you in our hearts. We now place one more stone in the sand for all the joys and sorrows that exist in our hearts but remain unspoken today. From far and near, please say with me our caring words. 
Let us hold in our circle of caring each person here. Let us hold in our hearts those who are unable to be with us today. Let us hold in our memories those who have moved on. Let us find comfort in knowing that we are not alone. We know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and from hard work. We're so grateful for this, and we commit together to ensure that the funds we gather collectively do a greater good for ourselves and our world than they could have done alone. If you're with us today in person, you can put your offering in the baskets being passed by the ushers. If you're joining us virtually, you can make your offering by mailing a check to the church or by going to the UUCNH.org website, finding the link in the upper right-hand corner that says donate and making a contribution equivalent to what you would put in the plate or more. If you're here for the first time, please, we invite you to let the basket pass. You are our guests. The morning offering will now be given and gratefully received. Would you please join with me in saying the dedication to our offering? The words will be on the screen. May these gifts and the work of our hands and hearts give power to all we stand for as a community of faith. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. Debbie Leuster Stuber was born and raised on Long Island and majored in elementary education at the University, the State University of Oneonta, New York. She moved to Pittsburgh in 1991 and now calls Pittsburgh her hometown. Uh, Debbie is a senior customer service representative for an electronics manufacturer. <laughs> I've known Debbie at the electronics manufacturing company for many years. Uh, shortly after moving to Pittsburgh, she met the director of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh and has been a volunteer for the last 20 plus years. In 2021, Debbie was chosen as their volunteer of the year. Debbie is married and has three grown sons. Her parents are 94 and 95 and live in Boynton Beach, Florida. I believe they're watching right now. Telling her parents' Holocaust experience to schools, universities, and various organizations for the last several years has been her passion. Debbie feels strongly that it's the responsibility of her generation and generations to come to carry on the survivor's legacy. Debbie, welcome. Thank you for coming. Good morning. It's my honor and privilege to tell you my parents' story this morning. Thank you to Mark Swihart and Allison Zadnick, I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong, and the congregation for inviting me to speak. Special thanks to the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, who continues to support me as well as my friends and family, some of whom are here this morning. 
I'm very blessed that my parents, who are both Holocaust survivors, are alive and well at 94 and 95. In November of 2018, shortly after the Tree of Life massacre here in Pittsburgh, my sister spoke at a vigil in Brooklyn, New York. And in part of her speech, she mentioned that when she and I were girls, my father would always say, you know, the Holocaust could happen again, and you better have your passports ready to go to Israel. My sister would respond, Dad, this is the United States. That would never happen here. As time goes by, the voices and the eyewitnesses of the Holocaust are dwindling. The Anti-Defamation League, a leading anti-hate organization in the United States, determined that in 2020, there were 2,026 anti-Semitic incidents and 2,717 in 2021, and that's only the number that was reported. As we all know, anti-Semitism in all forms of hatred is ever prevalent in our society. Just this weekend, white supremacist groups um, said that this weekend would be a national day of hate. It was in the news. Um, it wasn't very, I don't think it was really too much in the media. Sharing our family stories of, is of the utmost importance. It's now my generation's responsibility and the next to carry their torch. After this morning, you will be witnesses to my family story, and I hope that you will impart what you hear with others. My mom, Edith Leuchter, was born in Bruchsal, Germany, on December 31st, 1927. Her father owned Max Loeb Grocery Store, named after him, and he sold canned goods and produce, butcher supplies and tools. The family lived above the grocery store. In July of 1938, Max made the difficult decision to emigrate to the United States, as he could tell that the future for him and his family was bleak. The plan was to send for his wife and children, but unfortunately, that never happened. When my grandfather Max arrived in New York, he sent this telegram to his wife Julia and his children Edith and Heinz. Pictured here is that telegram, and you can see the swastika emblem stamped on the envelope. Pictured here is my mother's family. On the left is Yulia, my grandmother, and then Yulia and her husband in the 1920s on their wedding day. My mother, Edith, on the right with her little brother, Heinz, the, and a picture of the grocery store. On Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, November 9th, 1938, excuse me, Edith was awakened in the wee hours of the morning. She could hear sirens and breaking glass and could even see flames outside of her window, at which point she crawled into bed with her mother, Yulia, to seek comfort. Until my trip to her hometown this past October, when I stood in front of the home my mother lived in as a child, I didn't realize that the flames she saw were from her own synagogue, which was just steps from her home. My grandmother, Yulia, said it was no longer safe to stay in their home, so they moved to Matilda Vile's house, Edith's grandmother, about 10 minutes away. Soon after, Heinz, Edith's brother, was sent to a school in Frankfurt. Edith is bitter to this day about the fact that he was sent away because she feels that if he wasn't, our family story could have turned out differently and he might have survived. The letter pictured here is from Heinz to his father, Max, in the United States and a drawing we believe Heinz made of himself and his sister Edith. He must have missed her so. My family is fortunate enough to have many letters and drawings from my uncle Heinz. From that school, Heinz was moved to an orphanage in Frankfurt and eventually deported to Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. A letter from Heinz to his aunt and uncle is pictured here. He ends the letter with a thousand kisses, your loving Heinz. The letters in my mother's possession have been translated for us. In May 1944, he was deported to Auschwitz. He was placed in a specific area called the Theresen Family Camp. 17,517 people were deported from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz. As the Allies were beginning to learn about the Holocaust, this camp was created within Auschwitz to mislead the world about the final solution. Heinz was on a transport of 2,499 people. Upon arrival in Auschwitz, 
He was given a prisoner number between A1445 and A2506. Of the 17,517 people who were deported from Theresienstadt, only 261 survived. Heinz was not one of them. He either died of starvation or disease or was murdered in the gas chambers. Oops, I'm sorry. On October 22, 1940, at least 6,500 Jews were deported from Bruxelles and surrounding areas in southwestern Germany. Edith, her mother Julia, and her grandmother Matilda were given one hour to gather a few possessions and were marched to the railroad station along with the other Jews in the town of Bruxelles, numbering about 120 people. The footage I'm about to show you was discovered only a few years ago in the Bruxelles, Germany archives. It was hidden. And this past October, my family met the gentleman who's responsible for having the footage made public. Only after he told the local government officials that he would bring them to court if the footage wasn't made available. In February 2020, we discovered that my mother and her grandmother are in the footage. I'm trying to, there it is, okay. In this frame, on the far right, is my mom with the beret, and her mother is to the left of her, carrying a purse and a blanket. And I'm going to play the footage now. My family traveled in October to Bruxelles, Germany, as the local theater produced a play entitled The Girl with the Hat Box, based on my mother's story. I'm more than happy to answer questions about my experience there during the Q&A session following my presentation. When they arrived at the railroad station, Julia asked for permission to call her son Heinz in Frankfurt to see if he could join them. The police denied this request, but she was given approval to go home to look for the papers that she said she had to emigrate to the United States. She went back twice, but for whatever reason, the papers were not there. From inside the railroad station, they could see outside the windows. Townspeople, including children, were yelling that they were happy to see the Jews leave Bruxelles and were spitting at them. Eventually, they boarded the train, and they breathed a small sigh of relief because as they crossed the Rhine River, they realized they were traveling south toward France as opposed to east toward Poland. A few days later, they arrived in Gers, an internment camp in southwestern France. I just wanted to point out that there were no concentration slash death camps in France, but there were many internment camps. Edith had to use straw to make mattresses, and there were too few blankets for too many people. Edith described that it was extremely disgusting and very muddy. She attended school, but learned very little. In April 1941, Edith, her mother, and her grandmother were deported to another camp called Rivesalt in the area of Perpignan, still in the south of France. In October, one of our friends in my mother's hometown presented us with a memorial book from the camp, from the camp as well as two stones he brought back with him, which was extremely meaningful. My grandmother, Yulia, developed a hernia at this point and was ill. At this camp, the bar barracks were infested with insects 
<clears throat> and according to my mom, the beds looked like cages for rabbits. One bright spot was that Max, Edith's father, was able to send packages and money from the United States. Edith was always hungry. She says the food consisted of watery soup with vegetables that looked like weeds. Her mother had to cut her hair off at one point because of the proliferation of lice in the camp. The Vichy government of France gave the difficult choice to the parents in the camp to sign their children over to an organization called OSE, which translates to Children's Aid Society. This was a Jewish underground organization that operated throughout the war and saved over 5,000 Jewish children. Edith had to say goodbye to her mother, Yulia, and her grandmother, Matilda, but couldn't hug her grandmother because Matilda had body lice at this point. A few months later, she received a telegram from her mother that she was deported to Drancy, another internment camp in Paris, and eventually deported to Auschwitz. We all hope that Yulia didn't make it there and died of the hernia in the cattle car on the long trip there. However, we will never know. By the end of the war, Edith was in five schools and orphanages. While she was in one school, she was also a part-time nanny for a family in the area of Alsace-Lorraine, the geographic area between France and Germany. Edith was given the false French name Edith Labbé and papers that indicated she was from that area as well, which made sense because she was from Germany and was already learning French. Toward the end of the war, she became a French Girl Scout and upon liberation was able to get an affidavit from her father, Max, and emigrated to the United States. She reached the port of New York on a freighter called the Fort Royale on April 23, 1946. This is an ad my grandfather, Max, played in a German, placed in a German Jewish newspaper post-war <clears throat> searching for his wife and son my uncle and my grandmother, who, as I said earlier, did not survive. I use this map um, more for students than adults to indicate how far away my mother and father's birthplace were. Bruchsal, Germany is near Heidelberg and Kurt was born in Vienna. My father, Kurt Leuster, as I said, was born in Vienna, Austria. On February 6, 1929, his father, Moritz, owned a wholesale silk business. My father was an only child, and he and his parents vacationed each year, and they had a pretty good life until March 12, 1938. This is the day when Germany annexed Austria, otherwise known as the Anschluss, and all the borders were closed. On Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, Kurt was sent home early from school at about 9.30 in the morning. On his way home from school, he saw a synagogue burning, and the SS were shooting and dragging the men out of the synagogue, forcing them to throw the Torahs, the Jewish Bibles, into the Danube River. He hurried home. When he arrived there, the SS were arresting his father and nine other Jewish men. Kurt sat on the steps crying and waited for his mother Rosa to return home from shopping. She knew it was too dangerous to stay, so they walked three blocks to Kurt's grandmother's house. On their way, two SS approached them. One grabbed Kurt, and the other grabbed Rosa by the hair and threw them down onto the street. A woman passerby who tried to help them, the, excuse me, a woman passerby tried to help them, but the SS threatened her with being sent to Dachau concentration camp. When they got to Kurt's grandmother's house, Kurt's cousin Heinz, no relation to my mother's brother, and his aunt Paula were there as well. Ten days later, there was a knock at the door, and to their surprise, it was Moritz. He had been held in an armory, and the SS treated him badly and threatened to cut off his finger if he couldn't take off his wedding ring, which fortunately he was finally able to do. Moritz was told by the Nazis that he had three months to get his family out of Austria. Moritz was able to procure a visa via Genoa, Italy, and in February 1939, they arrived in Antwerp, Belgium. They had with them a few suitcases and a bit of jewelry that they had hidden in their clothing. Here in Antwerp, 
Kurt learned how to speak Flemish and French in school, and things were quiet for a while. Soon after arriving in Antwerp, my father was issued this passport, which, as you can see, has a swastika stamped on it, as well as the name Israel that you can see above his own name, Kurt. The Nazis assigned the name Israel to all Jewish boys and Sarah to all Jewish girls, one of the many ways they ripped away people's identities. In Antwerp, they ended up living very near a man who happened to be from the town of Brody, Poland, which also happened to be Moritz, Kurt's father's hometown, as he moved to Vienna when he was a little boy. One night, when Kurt was eavesdropping on his parents' conversation, he heard that the neighbor would let them hide a bit of jewelry in a washcloth in his basement wall. On May 10, 1940, the Germans invaded Belgium. Moritz, along with the other Jewish men were deported by the Belgians to the south of France. In July 1940, Rosa and Kurt were moved to a detention camp in Limburg, Belgium. My father's Aunt Paula, who looked Aryan as she had blonde hair and blue eyes, approached the Gestapo to procure papers for them to Paris and was granted permission. They didn't stay long, though, as they wanted to be near Moritz, so they hired a guide to take them across the demarcation line. The sign pictured here is part of the permanent exhibit at the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, which is currently located at Chatham University. And I also like to point out that with time tickets for no charge from 12 to 3 on Monday through Friday, you can take a tour of the exhibit there. I'd like to read what the sign says. Jews are forbidden to cross the line of demarcation to go to the occupied zone of France. Jews are those who belong or belong to the Jewish religion, or who have more than two Jewish ancestors in their grandparents' generation. An individual's grandparents will be considered Jewish if they belong or belong to the Jewish religion. Any violation of the present decree will be punishable by imprisonment or a fine and by the possible confiscation of property. They crossed at night with 14 other Jews. The SS were guarding the border with guard dogs and machine guns. Luckily, they crossed without incident, and at this point, they boarded a train for Marseille in the south of France. Kurt and his mother Rosa were supposed to go to Marseille, but accidentally got off one stop before, which was extremely dangerous because they had no ID papers. Somehow, at 11 years old, my father, Kurt, had the wherewithal to push his mother through the train station. They registered with the Jewish agency and were put in another detention camp called Hotel Terminus. By this time, Morris was in three different internment camps, Saint-Cyprien, Gers, which I had mentioned earlier in my mother's story, but were in different sec they were in different sections, so they never crossed paths, and lastly, Condé Mill. This camp was about 30 miles from where he and his mother were. My father was able to bring food to his father on the weekends. Soon after, after, Rosa and Kurt were moved to this camp as well. All three were able to get a pass to go to the city of Marseille, and my father had his bar mitzvah there at a synagogue. Soon after, Kurt's parents were given that same difficult choice to turn their son over to OSE. And on August 9th, 1942, they signed the papers. This is the last letter that Rosa and Moritz, my grandparents, wrote to Kurt, which he still has in his possession. Loosely translated, they plead with him to procure food for them, and then he should take care of everything and to please make them proud. Months later, Kurt found out that Rosa and Moritz were both murdered in the gas chambers in Auschwitz. Kurt was then placed in Hotel Bompard, which was repurposed as a detention camp. The conditions were terrible, so he and some friends just decided to escape one night when the French police were drunk. They were caught and were brought back there. The second time they escaped, they were more careful and went undetected. Somehow they knew there was a home sponsored by OSE called Majelier. There, my father was able to procure food from nearby farmers using a bicycle with a wagon. Here's where he met a young girl named Edith, who he liked, but the feeling was not reciprocated. <laughs> Kurt, in 
Kurt and his friends were told that they could go to the port of Marseille and board a ship for the United States, but at that point, the U.S. had reached Africa and the German U-boats were bombing the armed forces, so he was sent back to the orphanage for a brief period of time. I seem to be missing slides. Hold on one second. There we go. Sorry. In February 1943, Kurt was moved to a boy's delinquent home in a town called Je Bois. The director of the home, Mademoiselle Burel, knew he was Jewish, and she had a connection to the mayor of that town, and he was able to procure, provide false papers for Kurt. His new name was now Claude Lambert. He, like my mother, was supposed to be from Alsace-Lorraine because he was from Austria, so he spoke German, and since he was in France, he was learning to speak French. In the orphanage, he cooked and chopped wood and performed various other chores. Months later, somebody squealed that there was a Jewish boy hiding in the home. So the Nazis came looking for him. He was hiding in a closet for several hours, and luckily the Nazis didn't open it. The director knew at this point that Kurt could no longer stay there, and she made a connection for him to the Maquis, the French underground. And for the next year, Kurt lived in the woods and helped to blow up the last truck of German convoys and the rails that they passed. They received French, British, and American assistance. Upon liberation, he was sent to two more orphanages in France, one in Lyon and one in Paris. At one point, he went back to the neighbor in Antwerp, Belgium. Sure enough, the jewelry was still in the washcloth in the basement wall, and he brought his father's gold pocket watch and his mother's bracelet and wedding ring to America. In Paris, he got a job making leather handbags and in the evening attended a technical school. In August 1946, he boarded the French troop ship, the Athos II, and along with 70 other orphans, who he took care of on the journey, arrived in the port of New York on September 8, 1946. In January 1947, my father was standing outside the Museum of Modern Art on the sidewalk talking to his friends when who should tap him on the shoulder <laughs> but Edith, the girl he liked in Magelier, the orphanage in France. They embraced, and Edith must have seen something different in Kurt this time because they fell in love. And on August 13, 1950, they were married, which also happens to be my son's birthday. Interestingly enough, my mother worked for a haberdashery, a hat factory, in the Empire State Building, and the play we just attended in Germany is entitled The Girl with the Hat Box. In January 1952, my father was drafted into the U.S. Army and spent nine months in Korea on the 38th parallel. Luckily, he made it home safe. Eventually, my dad became an aerospace engineer for Grumman Aerospace without a high school or college degree. My father worked on the guidance navigation system of a couple of different Apollo missions, and his name pictured here, it's diagonal, you can see Kurt Leuchter, along with several other hundred engineers, is still on microfiche on the moon. And our family has several copies of this, of plaques similar to this in our homes. In 2011, my father was awarded the Legion of Honor Medal given to World War II veterans by the French government. When I read the letter that accompanied it, something just didn't make sense to me. I knew my father was a Holocaust survivor, a Korean War vet, and that his name was on the moon, but then realized for the first time that since he fought in the French resistance, he's also a World War II veteran. In 2017, my family was fortunate enough to travel to my mother's hometown, Bruxelles, Germany, and we had five Stolperstein installed. Stolperstein means stumbling stone. This project was created by a non-Jewish German. There are now about 96,000 Stolpersteins in 31 European countries, and it's considered the largest deconstructed Holocaust memorial in the world. I suggest if you travel to Europe, please look down. These Stones were placed in front of people's homes, whether they were murdered or not. So the five that we have are for Julia and Max, my grandparents, 
for Heinz and Edith, my mother and uncle, and my maternal great-grandmother Matilda Weil. Matilda Weil's prayer book from the 1880s, pictured here, somehow survived, and we were able to use this prayer book to recite the Jewish morning prayer during the ceremony. The townspeople of Bruchsal were absolutely wonderful in that they welcomed us with open arms and hearts and were so generous. Several spent the day of the ceremony with my family. There was even an assembly at the local middle school with presentations by students. One of the students who presented inf information about my family's story actually attended this play last October that I just mentioned and it meant a great deal to me. I grew up on Long Island, New York, in a loving but complicated home. My parents were extremely overprotective, understandably so. My first experience with anti-Semitism was in first grade, when my classmate called me a dirty Jew. In middle school, a boy set firecrackers in the stairwell as I was leaving. When I was 16 and home alone, the mailbox affixed to our house was blown up, and eggs were thrown at the home in, on, on an occasional basis. At my current job many years ago, my former boss, who sat not too far from me, was on the phone one day and I overheard him saying to a customer, well, why don't you just do him down? And more recently, I went to a local sandwich shop in my neighborhood, which is the Fox Chapel area, and I asked the server if they had these cookies called black and white cookies. They're, they're a, a, New, a New York cookie, I don't know if they're related to the Jewish community at all, but anyway, I said I had had them at my synagogue, and she said, well, you don't look Jewish. In 2019, the brother of my classmate who called me a dirty Jew in first grade made a post on my high school's Facebook group, irrelevant of, of any of this. But when I saw his post, I decided to add a comment mentioning what his sister had said to me, and he contacted his sister, and she wrote me this email. My adult self is not shocked to see that this given what was said and taught in my house, but I am no less ashamed, horrified, and saddened, especially when I see how this has stuck with you and hurt you so badly. If it's any comfort, I am not the same person and do not advocate hate against anyone and don't tolerate it in my life. Maybe it's some comfort in knowing that I have not continued to hurt others like I hurt you. Thank you for being open to my message. It's great to hear that it had a positive effect. In some ways, this really changed my life, and I get to add it to the story as well. Before I close, I just wanted to mention, um, Allison put out in the, the lobby, or whatever that area is called, a page that has resources on it. So it's um, some of the things that I've mentioned in my talk or links to museums, et cetera. My parents are 94 and 95, and this past August celebrated their second, 72nd wedding anniversary. Pictured here are my two sons, my sister, and her two daughters. The little lady on the right is their first great-grandchild, and my granddaughter, who was born in September of 2021. My mother's last name is Loeb, which means strong man or lion. And my father's last name is Leuchter, which means candelabra. I'd like to think that the strength and many branches of my family that now exist give us all light and hope for the future. Thank you so much for listening. And now my parents are going to join us. I think I want to move with mom. Okay. Thank you, Fabienne. You're welcome. Hi, mommy. Hi, mommy. Hi, Debbie. Hey. Hi, daddy. One second. So, welcome to the Unitarian. Uh, can you see? 
Okay. So just to give you a warning, um, my father doesn't have very good hearing. My mother, on the other hand, has supersonic hearing. <laughs> and I just also wanted to tell you that if you do ask a question, I might have to repeat it for them only because I think sometimes they're more comfortable when they hear my voice. So, Mom and Dad, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the North Hills. Hi. Can you, what, what, do you, what do they see, by the way? They see me? Oh, okay, okay. Um, so I'd like to open, up, open it up to the congregation if anybody has any questions for them. Um, they can read Hebrew very well, as can I, but they cannot speak it. They have been to Squirrel Hill with me. They haven't traveled to Pittsburgh in several years now, as they're not able to, but they used to come visit um, me every single year. Thank you. Thank you. I am so incredibly blessed that I still have my parents. Okay, we have a question, Mom and Dad. Uh, yeah, I'd like to know, uh, after going through all the hell they went through, and they're now here in America, and you're seeing how it's being played out by idiots here, how, how do they react to it? Uh, so, Mom and Dad, after living through what you went through in Europe, we want to know how you feel about the current situation and all the idiots in the world. And I'm only repeating what the gentleman said because I agree, and I think this is a very welcoming community. Dad? Yes. Did you hear my question? Uh, how, how, I'll I say think, it again. So, what do you think about the current situation? Yeah, how do you feel? Well, it's not too good. All I gotta say is that we hope that nothing happens like in 1938 in Germany or Austria. It's a very bad situation right now. And I, I don't see any good things coming. Mom, how do you feel about the current world situation? It's not a good situation, especially with this uh, uh, you mean with white supremacists? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I yeah. agree, Mom. Yeah, it's not good. Do we have anybody else with a question? Okay, your son-in-law, Mark, has a question. Yes, um, Dad. Hi, how are you, Mom? Um, I just wanted to ask you, with everything that you have been through, and the difficulties in your life, and, and now the, the uh, chance to be in America and have the freedom um, you have, what is your message to the young people about how they can pre prevent this from ever happening again, such as the Holocaust? Dad, did you hear Mark? Yes, I heard okay, you. Okay, you know what we're talking about. What's your message, Dad? Uh, the message is, like I used to tell the kids before, it was that if you listen to the TV or you read a paper, a newspaper, don't listen to one person. Listen to about three different newspapers, three, maybe a four, and the same thing on, on TV. Difficult to different station and listen. And once you listen, you make up your own mind. You don't. You don't listen to one person. You make up your own mind what's good. And that's what you do. And that's the that you live for. You have to live your whole life. Whatever you decide that, that you think is right. Thank you, Dad. That's his me um, we try to make sure that he says that message every single time. And by the way, I just want you to know that since 
March of 2020, which we all know what that was, um, uh, they have joined us 25 to 30 times every single time I make a presentation. I think we have another question from a friend. Yes, I, I, first of all, I admire both of you for the strength that you had to get through what you did with other fellow Jewish people. What the Nazis did was horrific. Something like this can never, ever happen again. I'd like to know from, from both of you, what would you say to others as far as strength to get through something like this? What gave you the most strength? What gave you the most strength? What's your advice on how to live through a horrible situation or circumstance? That's hard to say, but to tell you, the only thing you can, uh, you know, there's always good people and there's bad people. What are you going to do? I mean, you're not going to change the bad people. The good people will do whatever they can. It's, uh, it was proven in World War II. I, we wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for good people. And there's always good people. Otherwise, you, you won't survive. I mean, that's, that's what you got to watch out for. Yeah. The other thing that Dad says a lot is, I mean, it's hard to put yourself in that situation. So you do what you have to do. We were very happy when we came to this country. It was a pleasure. In nineteen, in the forties, up to six, up to the sixties, and things started to change. Yeah, that's that's what the problem is. I mean, change for a lot of people, not just for Jewish people. Right, mom, mom. Um, were people listening? Did people want to listen to you and what happened to you when you first came here? No, they didn't want to listen. They didn't want to hear anything about what happened to us. And did you tell me that they didn't always believe you as well? They didn't believe me. No, they didn't believe what happened. Somebody, I, my sister remembers this more than me, but um, she says that um, somebody looked at my mother once and said, oh, you don't look so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Did we have any other questions? Yeah. Oh, we have a lot. I, I was no, no, I only say one thing. Oh, go ahead, Dad. I, I was very happy to join the American Army, but I was drafted. Thank you for your service. I thought they, the judge asked me if I had any, any objection. I said, no way. I said, I'm glad I'm in this country. By the way, the, the plaque that you can see on the wall is the one I shared in the presentation as well, or a different one, I forget which. Okay, we have a few more questions. This, this is a question from one of our people online right now. Okay. And it's to, to you, Debbie. It's what has been the reaction you've received from the students to whom you present? <sighs> so dad, this question is for me and um, from somebody um, who's listening on Zoom like you are and asking what is students' reaction when I tell the story. I believe they're truly impacted by it. I remember, I, I've been speaking at Dorseyville Middle School for about 10 or 15 years. Um, that's where it all started. And I specifically remember one student sought me out afterwards in the hallway and said, I will never forget your father's story, because at that point I was just sharing my father's story. Um, I spoke in Mount Lebanon last month, and the reactions were just absolutely incredible. I had one student come up to me and say that he just lost a lot of friends in Ukraine, so they were really open and um, willing to learn. And hopefully they are our hope for the future, right? Hang on, Dad, we got another question. Yeah. And Mom. I just wanted to know what he did when he was in the French resistance. Okay. Um, he's not going to answer that, but we'll ask him anyway. <laughs> no, that is What's so. Dad? Yes. Did you hear the question? No, I didn't hear it. 
Okay. Um, just let me set it up. So my parents have been extremely open with me since I'm four years old. Um, usually told me in snippets, and then we finally got everything in chronological order. This is one part of his story he won't share. The question is, what did you do in the French resistance? Uh, I don't uh, really want to discuss that. Thank you, Dad. I, we I appreciate that. Many, I was questioned many times. I just don't to talk about. That's okay, Dad. We understand. I'm so, you know, my parents are not concentration camp survivors. Um, so I've been very fortunate that they've shared. There are so many stories that will forever remain hidden because people were never able to share them. Okay, let's see if we have another question. Hi, Dad. Could you, could you tell us about the first time in this country, when, when you finally arrived here, that you felt comfortable and you could breathe a sigh of relief? Can you, did you hear? Yes. Oh, great. I, yeah, I can tell you, uh, we were both very happy, except for one thing, we were not used to the life in the United States. We were you had to get accustomed. So the first six months, we weren't too happy because it was strange for us to be in a different country, different language, and we had to learn the language and everything. It, it's, uh, it's, it's very hard. It's not very easy. I had to go work right away. I went to work. I remember making like 28 bucks a week. I could save $14 in those days out of 28. I had a room for $5 with some people. This was very nice. They gave me room and board. And uh, I could save a little money. Uh, as, I, as I kept going and, and I, I, uh, I got better, better, I found another job and I, I did much better. And, this, and I went, uh, I went and uh, tried to do everything I can until we, I met my, my girlfriend, my wife. And we worked together, we stayed together. She worked as a secretary in the, in the head uh, uh, military business for 10 years. And she was uh, making some money, good money. And I, was, I, I tried to make money for myself. I took any job just to, get, uh, just to be, uh, make some, some things so I could live, live on. Hey, uh, Mom. Luckily, I was oh, very sorry. lucky that eventually I met a friend and he got me a job in, uh, in a uh, factory that made television sets. And then I worked myself up from, uh, from uh, a, a, a technician to a, to a junior engineer to a senior engineer. And I, I, I did very well, I can't complain. Thanks, I, Dad. Thank Dad. I Dad. Learned to combine from the I love it. As far Ooh. as other boys. Hey, Dad. Let, let me let me see. If, um, hey, Mom. When you first came to America, did you feel comfortable and were you able to breathe a sigh of relief when you first came here? Did you feel comfortable when you came here, Mom, to America in 1946? Yes, mom. Yeah, I'm asking mom. Mom, do you hear me? Okay, that's all right. Do we have any uh, other questions? Mom, well, did you hear what I said? Oh. It was strange for me to be in America. And I, knew I wasn't used to this kind of life. Thanks, mom. We lived seven years in France. And uh, we were used to their, their system and their methods. Right, right. And it's very strange when you go from one country to another. Right. You have to learn the language. It's yeah. Not easy. Dad, let's see if we have any other questions, okay? Okay, maybe not. Oh, we do have another question. Good. Oh, okay. The question is, how many languages do you speak? Mommy, why don't you take this one? Mommy, how many languages do you speak? I speak English, German, and French.
Dad? Yes, I speak the same thing, German, French, English, and uh, Flemish, which we spoke in Antwerp, Belgium. And as somebody asked me before, they can read Hebrew and sing in Hebrew. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions for me, or if um, Al, oh, we have another question. going on today, the, our schools are doing away with uh, talking about the Holocaust. Um, I'm going to take this question if you don't mind. So I think it's about 20 or so states that require Holocaust education. And Pennsylvania is not one of them. You may not know this. The law in, highly encourages to teach it, but that could mean one lesson or a curriculum. Um, I know a lot about the, the, the books that are being banned, but I am not aware specifically of school districts who have ceased teaching Holocaust education. Maybe you know better than me, but I am, I am not aware of that. Um, but having said that, 20 out of 50 states ain't nearly enough. It should be mandatory in all 50 states, yeah. but yeah. not just Holocaust education, but anything yeah. having to do with genocide or identity-based violence. There's an, a, an organization that is um, an arm of the Holocaust Center. It's called LIGHT. It stands for Leadership in Genocide and Human Rights Training, and it's in about 17 different school districts, and they involve students to make a difference for the future. Um, and that's slowly growing. And um, the Holocaust Center you know, has resources to teach schools. And I'm hoping to retire very soon and speak way more than I can now since I have a full-time job. So I'm going to speak until I can no longer speak. Uh, Dad, I, did you want I, to say something? Yeah, I am very proud of my daughter. She's been working very hard to, to let the people know what the Holocaust was all about. Thanks, and Dad. And went through it. It's very good that she's doing this, and I'm very proud of her. Thank you. I also want to mention, you know, I, I speak at libraries, organizations. This is the first church I've spoken at. I've, I've been trying, yeah. I'm speaking at... I'm speaking at two more, but I also like to invite if anybody, um, Allison has my information, if anybody knows of any other organization that would like to have me speak, I'd be more than happy to. At this point, they want to continue with the service, so I just want to say thank you to everybody for listening. Debbie. Debbie and Kurt and Edith, what a great gift you've given us today. I knew this would be good. I had no idea. I had no idea how good this would be. Thank you so much. Um, as Debbie mentioned, uh, if you want to learn more about what she talked about, if you go in the YouTube chat, there's a QR code there. If you go out in Friendship Hall, Allison and Debbie have literature out there with more information, with uh, paper copies. And uh, let's close our service together with uh, uh, saying our, affirming our mission statement together. By building a loving religious community that celebrates spirit, celebrates life, and cherishes the connectedness of all things, we will transform ourselves and our world. As we extinguish our chalice, the closing words will be from Anne Frank. Anne Frank wrote, that's the difficulty in these times. Ideals, dreams, and cherished hopes rise within us only to meet the horrible truth and be shattered. It's really a wonder that I haven't dropped all my ideals because they seem so absurd and impossible to carry out. Yet I keep them, because in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart.
was going to do um, by me just a shame, which is I the same composer, but I thought I'm going to another year so that nobody knows. Nobody knows. No, no. 